seated. Ed, could you help me a little bit? We're going to need hymn books for people in the front rows. Thank you. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our refuge and our strength. I thank you that you are with us by your spirit in the good times and in the challenging times of life. I thank you that as we grieve, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We know that Sylvia has gone to be in your presence. So we rejoice in that fact. But we also realize, Father, the sense of loss that the family feels. As they reflect on memories, as they think about the lessons that they learned, probably one of the lessons being the lesson of hard work. We thank you, Father, for all who've come today and we pray, Father, that your presence and your peace will be amongst us as we celebrate Sylvia's life and her life in you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe some of you have come a distance. Somebody said that some has, have come as far away as Windsor to be here today. So thank you for those of you who've made a big effort to come quite a distance. The Lord is gracious to us in giving us good weather today, and so we're thankful that it wasn't last Saturday when it rained all day long, or Sunday when we had the freezing rain, so the Lord's good to us in that. Uh, after the service, we're going to be having a reception and luncheon downstairs, and all are invited to attend. And then after that, we're going to be having the interment, and it's very close, just over Macowan and up one, one uh, level to the Peaches uh, Cemetery. And any of you who are interested in going with the family, feel free to attend with them. The scriptures and the hymns have all been chosen by the family. And so we're going to start by singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. I believe it's 139 in your hymn book.
It's our privilege to have some family tributes at this time. We're going to have John Levering, a son, a Laura Hetherington, a granddaughter, and Jesse Levering, a daughter, come and speak. Is that the order that you would like? Then you, okay, Jesse's coming second, okay. Thank you uh, for coming out today to celebrate and honor Mom's life. Um, I'm going to choke up and slow down here sometimes. It's, uh, it's also, and, and this is not highly emotional, but I do this anyway. My, my dad's birthday. So it's just coincidence how it turned out. <clears throat> Dad would have been 108 t today. Um, Mom was born the sixth of nine children in the Gradanus um, clan, born into rural community, small farm in Friesland, England. Uh, Friesland, England. Friesland, the Netherlands. And as, as a child, she ended up, not ended up, but um, they spoke Fries in the house. And when she went to school, she had to learn Dutch. So she learned to read and write in Dutch and still go home and speak Fries in the house. So she became at a young age, bilingual. And she didn't read, learn to read and write in Fries. And she went to school to, to the age of, or grade seven, it's uh, in the flyers as well, and then out in the workforce. And that was how things were, I'm gonna say fairly typical in different countries at, at that time of, for people in her generation. Mary's mom in Ireland had much a similar background on the farm and out in the workforce early. And mom and dad got your paycheck for the most part too. Wasn't fair, but that, that's how it went. And times were also tight, so people lived a very frugal life, good life, but very frugal in some parts of the world. It's still like that, um, not North America so much. And one thing I always remember, and this wasn't with my mom, was with my granddad, Paka. He used to spend summers out in a farm, lots with the Claus family. And I don't know if you remember this, Heinze, but you guys will all remember your apple trees. You had real, two really nice apple trees out there. Yellow apples, delicious. August, wow. Really good. But as kids, we used to look up in the tree and get the apple that didn't have any holes in it, wormholes. Those were the ones to get. And our grandfather, we used to call him Paca, he noticed this, tuned into it, and he came and he got an apple off the ground. And he looked at it and took a bite, strategic bite, and then he showed us, and there was a worm wiggling out of the apple. And then he took a second bite, and the worm was gone. <laughs> Never did that. But that was mom's dad, and that was her upbringing along with the other um, Gradanus clan, and 
I think the being frugal was in the blood. It stayed. And I'm going to say I've got some of it in my blood as well, not as much. I always feel compelled to clean the plate off. And it's, it's a disappearing thing. But when we kind of think of it, we have to go back to it to be green. And the first R of the three R's is to reduce. So they were doing the right thing before their time. When mom was, and I don't totally know all the romance story, but mom was out working on a farm and my dad came along. My dad was a builder and he was working on the farm and they got connected and married in uh, 1946. And um, they went through tough times with uh, the German occupation in, uh, in Holland. They never spoke of the stories. I, I hear from other people some of the stories that went on, but my parents never spoke of it. It was just a, a black time, for, especially for my dad. They um, went to uh, town of Nijmegen after the war, and was, dad was working as, as a builder, and he had... Um, or, or they had two boys, which was Bill and I. And I think it was probably a pretty small trailer, so things were tight. And in 1950, they immigrated to, to Canada for a new life, bigger land, and, and they found it here. And um, most of Mom's siblings all ended up in the farming community here in Ontario. But dad being a builder, wanted nothing to do with cows and pigs. And uh, so we ended up living in Toronto. Um, and for the most part, I'm gonna say mom lived first a, a life of isolation. She had two little boys. And um, she, she was just learning the language and she didn't have a lot of people around her who who spoke the language, so I don't have any memories of that, but she was always, I'm gonna say, good-hearted and open, and it was never a, a bad thing for her. Then in the, um, in the 60s, my dad was working for the CPR, they moved out to Agent Court, and uh, we needed to move with the work. So that's when we ended up, or my parents bought the, the land here in Markham. And dad had built the first house it, that we lived in Toronto. That's my first memories. And it was a good memory. L living in the basement of this house. And, and so it wasn't even a house yet, it was just, just a basement. I don't even know if you'd be allowed to do that now. But, and we had um, a coal furnace for heat as well. And it was my mom's job, or she did it anyway, to shovel the coal. I remember seeing my, my mom shovel coal, but not my dad so often. If it was cold, mom was the one who got up. So shovel the coal. So when we moved to Markham, we didn't have uh, a car or anything in Toronto, uh, no phone, no TV. But when we uh, moved to Markham, somebody had to learn to drive. Well, Dad just figured it's, hey, beyond my capability. So Mom was the one in her 40s who learned to drive a car, which she had never done before, and starting in Toronto, move out to Markham. And she ended up having a valid driver's license until the age of 90. It was a good thing she wasn't driving at the end of her 80s, but she had a valid driver's license to do it. 
And moving out to Markham was a, a very good thing. Mum just enjoyed the rural life here and uh, the quietness and the church families that, that she had here and uh, felt very much at home and being blessed. And um, So I'm just going to close with saying thanks, Mum, for the gift of life that she's I'm going to say, given a number of us, some starting with me, the oldest, and we can go through and stop in at Nate and Kate uh, and a, f a few others in the middle. And uh, Mom always had a very strong, strong religious belief and just always had a comfort knowing that she was going to be with the Lord someday, so... Now, I'm happy to feel that she can be there and know that she's where she wishes to be. Um, so th thank you, Mom. As we're here today to remember Mum, we all hold different memories of her. I'll tell you a bit of who she was. From an early age, Mum attended church and Sunday school regularly. As a young person, Mum accepted the gospel message told in God's Word, the Bible, and trusted Jesus as her Savior. Psalm 139 says, If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. This promise was true for Mum when she and Dad emigrated to Canada with their young family. As her children grew, it was Mum's earnest prayer that they too would come to know and love the Lord Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. As weddings and births of grandchildren and great-grandchildren came along, Mum's prayer extended to include them also. Mum showed her love by being willing and available to care for others when needs arose. When, after the death of our grandfather, Mum's mother needed a place to live, she was welcomed into our home for the last 10 years of her life. Brent and Laura, Bill's children, spent numerous summers with us when they were young, and Mum enjoyed the privilege of caring for them. Mum's sister, Winnie, who had early dementia, a few times needed to be cared for when Uncle Case was in hospital. Mum brought her home, and they would drive to Guelph a few times to visit Uncle Case as he recuperated. When Mum's sister, Helen, was bedridden with a broken pelvis for six weeks, Mum went to stay with her as long as was needed, and they enjoyed each other's company. Mum did all of this out of love and just because that's what you do for family. However, if she were sitting here with us, Mum would not like the attention on her good deeds. Because Isaiah says, how then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Ephesians tells us, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works or good deeds, so that no one can boast. For we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Mum unequivocally wanted everyone to know and understand that salvation from God our Father comes through repentance and faith in Jesus. Mum and I would sometimes sit and hi sing hymns together at home. She loved taking long walks five miles around a country block here in Markham. Mum was practical. One time when she and Dad were building the house here in Markham, she had no vegetables for supper, and they were going home the next day anyway. So, well, it was late spring, and there were plenty of dandelions around, and 
Dandelion leaves are healthy food, so she picked a bunch and cooked them. That was the first and last meal that included dandelions. <laughs> Mum had a sense of humor, and as it might come up, would make a joke. While I was looking through pictures for, di for today, I came across two, taken before digital, so they both got printed. But you can see Mum has just made a comment, and before they were sitting ready for the picture, and everybody is laughing. Mum knit many hats and slippers in her later years to give to whoever needed them, also for the Street Connection mission in Toronto. Mum had faults, as we all do, and disappointments and hardships along the way, but her anchor was always Jesus. Mum had a long life, and she continued firm in her faith to the end, not moved from the hope held out to us in the gospel. Years ago, Mum would say to me, when I get old, I want to live in a little house in the bush. In the trees is a healthy place to live. When Mum needed to go to a nursing home, it was called Columbia Forest. Not the kind of bush she meant, but it shows God's humor and care for us. When I was going to leave Mum in the nursing home, I would tell her, I'm going out now. But I'll come back. See you later. Now Mum has gone out, home to Jesus, and I don't want her to come back. But I'll see you later, Mum. Jesus, I trust you, Jesus. I'm Laura, Sylvia's granddaughter, her oldest son, Bill's daughter. I'm sure that Grandma and Dad um, have been enjoying catching up with each, each other these past few days. Just sit right in front here. I want to share on behalf of the grandchildren, Brent, myself, and Gerald, Corey and Adam, Mike and Laura, and Molly, um, Dean and Lisa, as well as the great-grandchildren, Nate and Owen, and Aiden, and Jordan, and Kate. A thank you to Grandma, Beppa, for my grandchildren, um, my children as well. She, she allowed them to call her Beppa. Um, I wasn't allowed to call her Beppa, but they could call her Beppa because they had three great-grandmas, so there had to be some form of differentiation. Um, but she loved us all, um, and I know that she kept us all in her prayers and wanted us to be healthy and happy, and most of all loved, and to know the love of Jesus. Grandma was a strong person, physically and spiritually, but she had a silly side too. If you were watching the photos, I'm sure that you saw the picture with her on lookout, <laughs> and with Aiden's foot in her mouth as they were reading a story. Um, and I remember once when Grandma and Aunt Jess were visiting and I looked over as I was getting dinner ready and the boys had been horsing around with Grandma and had, you know, started getting a little rough and I was telling them, you know, be careful, she's, she's in her 80s. And Aunt Jess was like, oh, Laura, she started it. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> um, Brent, when Brent and I were young, um, we, used to, we spent a number of summers living with Grandma and Grandpa and Aunt Jess. We always had fun there, and we learned lots also. Took a, Grandma took us to swimming lessons, Sunday school, and to VBCs. She made sure we understood the importance of giving thanks at our, each meal, and she read us a Bible story after dinner. She had books for us to read and color. She taught me to knit and to appreciate just being outside. We composted and recycled there before blue bins and green bins. Grandma juiced before it was trendy. 
Anything Grandpa grew, she would juice. Beet juice in, in any blend with other fruits or vegetables was my least favorite. Um, many things that I've learned from Grandma I've carried with me. Um, even some of the trademark Frisian stubbornness. Uh, when I was in grade two, the teacher asked um, in our school if, if our family spoke any other languages. My teacher was not familiar with Fries and told me that I was making it up. Um, I went home and told Dad. Dad told me, Lord, just tell people it's Dutch. It's easier that way. In my head, I was like, oh, my grandma would be so mad if I did that. I can't do that. <laughs> Um, um, and, and I still do have some, some stubbornness myself that way. So um, I also try to get as many vegetables into my family as possible. I don't juice, though. I've had enough of that. Um, and I always um, keep my family, them, and, and you all as well, in my prayers. I'm grateful for the time we had with Grandma, for the things she, she taught us that we learned. Um, and that we will continue to carry with us and hopefully pass along. We're going to turn in our hymn books to number 426, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. sharing such kind words about mom and grandmother and great-grandmother. Uh, two of the grandchildren, Corey and Michael, are going to come and read some very special passages of scripture that have been chosen by the family. The first reading is Psalm chapter 116, verse 1 through 9. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. 
For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, faith we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of the Lord, of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The third uh, reading is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Uh, and our sister Molly can't be with us here today in body, but she's certainly here in spirit. So. We'll do this reading on her behalf. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first time, heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I now... And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The final reading is Psalm chapter 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of these passages of scripture read so ably by both Corey and Michael. We're going to sing number four, four, four. Now I love to tell the story, verses one, three, and four. I love to tell the story of
It has been my privilege uh, for the last 15 years to know Sylvia and Jesse. So in some respects, I've only known Sylvia since she was in her 80s. And I remember when I first visited her at her house in McCowan, I had no idea that she was known for her milking prowess or her farm background, but I should have gathered because I saw such a large vegetable garden, and she was most interested in telling me all about it. In some ways, my first major connection with Sylvia took place in 2005. I imagine all of the family remember, some of us may not, but uh, Jessie uh, fell and broke her pelvis. And then she went uh, for, sorry? I guess you can call it a leg or you can call it a pelvis. It was the pelvis. So then she was in rehab for quite some time at Providence Villa. And those of you who know her know that she's an active person. So she didn't rest long enough and she broke it again. And so that must have been a very difficult time for you, Jesse, and for the rest of the family, helping your mother to stay in bed and to behave herself when she wanted so much to get out and about. My wife and I had the, vi the opportunity to visit so Sylvia at the long-term care facility in Waterloo, a very nice place there, and to uh, meet with her. And she was so excited to see us that she spoke to us in either Frisian or in Dutch, but never in English. So we had a little difficulty uh, being able to understand, but we could tell from her face that she was glad that we were there. The scripture passages were chosen very specially by the family and were very special to Sylvia. Sylvia almost had 98 years here in this world. In Psalm 116, verse 15, which was last read, at first seems to be a very strange verse. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What do people hold as precious? Well, if I listen to the television, it tells me that all women like diamonds. So I guess they see that as precious, and some people see gold as precious, and some see ointments and other kinds of things as precious. But probably to most people, the most precious thing that they have is their children should I say until their grandchildren come along <laughs> and their great-grandchildren? Well, I shouldn't say that. Their children. So children and uh, their offspring are often a great joy and very precious uh, to people. I'm sure that, that her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, some of who were able to put carnations on the casket today, are very, very special to, to Sylvia. I say children are very special because if you were to go to Facebook or some other means, you would probably see a lot of pictures of children and grandchildren. We had a new child born into the church family, and we saw lots of pictures already of a child that was just born a few days ago. So it's amazing how quickly they get into the multimedia side and get, in a sense, passed on so others can see who they are and how happy they are parents are. Humans, the scripture says, are all created in the image of God. God's saints, in verse 15, are not those who have performed two miracles, 
been beatized and then canonized and made to be saints necessarily in the Catholic Church. Many people see saints only from that direction because that's all they know. Who then are God's saints whose death is precious to them? A saint, or in the Greek it just means a holy one, is anyone who has put their trust in Jesus who died and rose again to pay the penalty for their sins. God forgives that person, adopts them into his family. They become his children in a very special way and become very precious to him. Death does not come as a surprise to God. Death is not an accident. From God's perspective, death is an appointment. You see in Psalm 139, and Jesse read some of that today, there's a verse that says this, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God knew before Jesse, before Sylvia was born, how many days she'd live. And he was very gracious to her. The scripture talks about three score and 10 or 70 or four score 80, but it doesn't say often about 98 or 100. And so Sylvia had those extra years to be able to meet great grandchildren and others that brought much joy to her life. We heard from Jesse that it was in Holland at an early age that Sylvia prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior and her Lord. And it seems that as the stories were told that she kept that faith and shared the Bible stories and prayed for her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren until she died. Verse 8 and 9 of Psalm 116 says this, For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The psalmist, it seems in this passage, is struggling with a life-threatening situation, and he cries out to the Lord to save him, and the Lord does that. He talks about it by saying that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living here on earth. My mother was born the same year as Sylvia, so they have something in common. I think the other thing they have in common, my mother wasn't born in Holland, she was born in Canada, but another thing they have in common is often when you get to be 97, you start thinking a lot about heaven. And you start thinking about what your body can't do and the things you can't remember and those kinds of things. And so on occasion, my mother would say, and I'm sure your mother's probably said this to you too. Why am I still here? And I say to my mother, you're here until the master has finished his work in your life. So my mother, even today, prays for people and people come to visit her at her condo uh, that are friends of other people that she's prayed for because she loves people and prays for them. And I'm sure that Sylvia prayed for many as well. And she, like my mother, probably was thinking seriously about that experience of being face-to-face with Jesus in heaven. As we age, as our body deteriorates, can any of you identify with that? No? None of you have aged or have difficulties with pain or other kinds of experiences or... uh, have some eye issues <laughs> or other kinds of things that are taking place. Yes, as we age, uh, it becomes a challenge for us in some respects to be able to handle certain kinds of things. And yet, in the second reading that was read, uh, Paul gives us these words. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So through the word of God and the spirit of God speaking into Sylvia's heart, she could be renewed day by day. 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on the seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The Apostle Paul went through so much. And I'm sure that Sylvia and her husband went through a lot of difficult times in Holland during the war. And yet Paul is able to say, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. When we have an eternal perspective, how we live on earth starts to change in how we see it. Some people who don't have any concept of eternity only think of this life as the be-all and the end-all of what they have. But when you start to look in the larger picture, you start to see that some of the challenges, some of the difficulties that we face in life pass. Then there's some good days and some other things that happen. And some of you have all gone through your valley experiences, I'm sure. Just as Sylvia has gone through her valley experiences, and Jesse and John, in a sense, are going through, and, and others are going through some of their valley experiences, even now. At death, Sylvia's soul went to heaven to be with Jesus, her Savior and her Lord. Her ordained day that was written before she was born was last Thursday. God said, it's time to come home. Your work for me here on earth is done. You see, every Christian is called to be an ambassador, to represent the king of kings. And when that work as ambassador is done, he calls us back home. Just like we have ambassadors that we send out from Canada, they go out for a period of time, and then they're called back home. Maybe given another commission, I don't know. But we're ambassadors, uh, those as, that have, are Christians, are ambassadors for Jesus. And uh, her, her task as an ambassador is finished. All Christians believe that on Jesus' return, that we will receive a new, immortal, eternal, pain-free, fully functioning body. So we have Sylvie here in a casket. In a few hours, we will have an interment and she will be buried in the ground just nearby at Peaches. But she's only going to be there temporarily because when Jesus comes, he's going to give her a new resurrection body. And I think that's probably the theme of the verses that Jesse chose. I assume it was Jesse chose for the grandchildren to read as the focus of this day of celebration. You see, her soul has gone be, to be with the Lord, and one day, verse 5 of chapter uh, of 2 Corinthians, the first verse that was read, talks about a new body. And the rest of that chapter talks about what that's like, having a new resurrection body that will be one that we will live in forever. Yes, Sylvia will be missed. Many will mourn, especially the family. But Jesus loved her so much that he wanted her to come home. And so she's been promoted to heaven. And she lives in the presence of Jesus. She sees him face to face. She's able to talk with him. And one day he's going to give her a new immortal body. One that's where no bones can break. One that's going to be pain-free. One that has perfect memory. As a matter of fact, it's so hard to even imagine the greatness and the glory of heaven and that opportunity that we have to be with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that great salvation that you offer to each one of us as you came to die on the cross for our sin. We thank you that Sylvia received that gift of eternal life and salvation that you offered to her and that you provided not only a wonderful life here, but you promised that you are providing a place for her in heaven today. We're so thankful for her life and that you're all here to be able to celebrate 
Sylvia's life with us and to be here for the family. We're going to close by singing one more hymn. And I need to look it up here. It's uh, Trust and Obey, number 571. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. And then we're going to have uh, Jesse's present pastor from Faith Missionary Church in Kitchener uh, come and uh, uh, bring the closing prayer and benediction for us. be having a procession with the casket out and the family will be following and, the, and those of you can follow we're going to be out at the front and then the front stairways takes you down to the reception area so we encourage you to follow along with us let's pray together Father this morning we started by singing that song Great is Thy Faithfulness and Lord even as we've looked back over our own lives and, and seen your hand upon us Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in Sylvia's life. Lord, almost 98 years on this earth, you've known her, you knit her together in her mother's womb. All her days were written in your book before one of them came into being. Lord, she was your handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which you prepared in advance for her to do, and she did them. And as a result, so many here today so many people in this world have been blessed, have encountered you through her life, have experienced your love through her words and through her actions. And Lord, we thank you for that because it's the result of your faithfulness. It's the result of your son dying on the cross for her. It's the result of your Holy Spirit opening her eyes to the truth and giving her the faith to respond Lord, it's because of you that we're here today to celebrate not just the past, but the present and the future. Lord, the fact that she's with you, that she's celebrating you. Lord, her body works, her mind works. There is joy and there is peace. And even as there's grief this side of eternity because someone who is loved is gone from this place, Lord, there is also joy and peace because we know where she's at. And we know your love for her. She's your daughter. Thank you, Lord. 
And now to him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, power and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, right now and forevermore. Amen and God bless you.